Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar, translated by Thomas Rice Holmes, Book Four, Chapter Twenty. Only a small part of the summer remained, and in these parts, the whole of Gaul having a northerly trend, winter sets in early. Nevertheless, Caesar made active preparations for an expedition to Britain, for he knew that in almost all the operations in Gaul, our enemies had been reinforced from that country. Besides, if there were not time for a campaign, he thought that it would be well worth his while merely to visit the island, see what the people were like, and make himself acquainted with the features of the country, the harbors, and the landing places. For of all this the Gauls knew practically nothing. No one, indeed, readily undertakes the voyage to Britain except traders, and even they know nothing of it except the coast and the parts opposite the different regions of Gaul. Accordingly, though Caesar summoned traders from all parts to meet him, he could not ascertain the extent of the island, what tribes dealt therein, their strength, their method of fighting, their manners and customs, or what harbors were capable of accommodating a large flotilla. To procure information on these points, before risking the attempt, he sent Gaius Volusenus, whom he considered perfectly competent, with the galley, instructing him to make a thorough reconnaissance and return as soon as possible. At the same time he marched with his whole force for the country of the Marini, as the shortest passage to Britain was from their coast, and ordered ships to assemble there from all the ports in the adjacent districts, as well as the fleet which he had built in the previous summer for the war with the Veneti. Meanwhile his design became known, and was reported by traders to the Britons, whereupon envoys came to him from several tribes of the island, promising to give hostages and to submit to the authority of the Roman people. On hearing what they had to say, Caesar graciously reassured them, and sent them home, enjoining them to abide by their resolve. Along with them he sent Comius, whom, after the overthrow of the Atrebates, he had set up as king over that people a man of whose energy and judgment he had a high opinion, whom he believed to be loyal, and who was reputed to have great influence in the country. He instructed him to visit all the tribes he could, to urge them to trust in the good faith of the Roman people, and to announce that Caesar would soon arrive. Volusenus reconnoitred all the features of the coast as far as he could get the chance, for he could not venture to disembark and trust himself to the natives, and in five days returned to Caesar and reported his observations. While Caesar was waiting in these parts to get his ships ready for sea, envoys came from a large section of the Marini to apologize for their recent conduct in attacking the Roman people and promise obedience to his commands, pleading that they were uncivilized and knew nothing of our ways. Caesar regarded this as most opportune, for he had no wish to leave an enemy in his rear, Owing to the time of the year, he had no means of undertaking a campaign, and he did not think it wise to postpone his expedition to Britain for trivialities. Accordingly, he ordered the envoys to furnish a large number of hostages, and on their arrival admitted the Morini to terms. About eighty transports, which he considered sufficient to convey two legions, were collected and assembled. The galleys, which he had besides, he assigned to the quaestor, the generals, and the auxiliary officers. Besides these, there were eighteen transports, eight miles off, which were prevented from making the same harbor by contrary winds. These he assigned to the cavalry, placing the rest of the army under the command of two generals, Quintus Titurius Sabinus and Lucius Arunculeus Cotta, with orders to march against the Menapii, and those clans of the Marini, from which no envoys had come, he directed another general, Publius Sulpicus Rufus, to hold a port with a force which he considered adequate. The arrangements were now complete, and, taking advantage of favorable weather, he set sail about the third watch, directing the cavalry to march to the further harbor, embark there, and follow him. They were rather dilatory in getting through their work. But Caesar, with the leading ships, reached Britain about the fourth hour, and there, standing in full view on all the heights, he saw an armed force of the enemy. The formation of the ground was peculiar, the sea being so closely walled in by abrupt heights that it was possible to throw a missile from the ground above on to the shore. Caesar thought the place most unsuitable for landing, and accordingly remained till the ninth hour, 
waiting at anchor for the other ships to join him. Meanwhile he assembled the generals and tribunes, told them what he had learned from Volusenus, and explained his own plans, charging them to bear in mind the requirements of war and particularly of seamanship, involving as it did rapid and irregular movements, and to see that all orders were carried out smartly and at the right moment. The officers dispersed, and, getting wind and tide together in his favor, Caesar gave the signal, weighed anchor, and sailing on about seven miles further, ran the ships aground on an open and evenly shelving shore. The natives knew what the Romans intended, sending on ahead their cavalry and charioteers, a kind of warriors whom they habitually employ in action. They followed with the rest of their force, and attempted to prevent our men from disembarking. It was very difficult to land for these reasons. The size of the ships made it impossible for them to ground except in deep water. The soldiers did not know the ground, and, with their hands loaded and weighted by their heavy, cumbrous armor, they had to jump down from the ships, keep their foothold in the surf, and fight the enemy all at once. While the enemy had all their limbs free, they knew the ground perfectly, and, standing on dry land or moving forward a little into the water, they threw their missiles boldly and drove their horses into the sea which they were trained to enter. Our men were unnerved by the situation, and having no experience of this kind of warfare, they did not show the same dash and energy that they generally did in battles on land. Caesar, noticing this, ordered the galleys, with the look of which the natives were not familiar, and which were easier to handle, to shear off a little from the transports, row hard, and range alongside of the enemy's flanks, and slingers, archers, and artillery to shoot from their decks, and drive the enemy out of the way. This maneuver was of great service to our men, for the natives, alarmed by the build of the ships, the motion of the oars, and the strangeness of the artillery, stood still, and then drew back a little. And now, as our soldiers were hesitating, chiefly because of the depth of the water, the standard-bearer of the tenth, praying that his attempt might redound to the success of the legion, cried, Leap down, men, unless you want to abandon the eagle to the enemy. I, at all events, shall have done my duty to my country and my general. Uttering these words in a loud voice, he threw himself overboard, and advanced bearing the eagle against the enemy. Then, calling upon each other, not to suffer such a disgrace, the men leaped all together from the ship. Seeing this, their comrades in the nearest ships followed them and advanced close up to the enemy. Both sides fought with spirit, but the Romans, being unable to keep their ranks unbroken, or get firm foothold, or follow their respective standards, and as they came from this or that ship joining any standard they met, became greatly confused, while the enemy knew all the shallows and when from their standpoint on shore they saw a few men disembarking one by one, urged on their horses, and, surrounding the little group in numbers, attacked them before they were ready. Others again got on the exposed flank of an entire company, and plied them with missiles. Caesar, noticing this, ordered the men of war's boats, and also the scouts, to be manned, and, whenever he saw any of his men in difficulties, sent them to the rescue. Our men, as soon as they got upon dry land, followed by all their comrades, charged the enemy and put them to flight, but could not pursue them far because the cavalry had not been able to keep their course and make the island. This was the only drawback to Caesar's usual good fortune. The beaten enemy, on rallying after their flight, at once sent envoys to Caesar to sue for peace, promising to give hostages and to obey his commands. The envoys were accompanied by the Atrebatian Comius, who, as I have already related, had been sent on by Caesar to Britain in advance. He had just landed, and, in the character of an envoy, was conveying Caesar's mandates to the Britons, when they seized him and locked him with chains. But now, after the battle, they sent him back, and, while suing for peace, laid the blame of the outrage upon the rabble, and begged that it might be overlooked in consideration of their ignorance. Caesar complained that, after the Britons had spontaneously sent envoys to the continent, and asked him for peace, they had attacked him without provocation, but said that he would pardon their ignorance and demanded hostages. Part of the required number they handed over at once, 
saying that they had to fetch the rest from long distances and would deliver them in a few days meanwhile they ordered their followers to go back to their districts while chiefs began to come in from all parts and place themselves and their tribes under caesar's protection peace had been thus established when three days after the expedition reached britain the eighteen ships mentioned above which had taken the cavalry on board sailed from the upper port with a light breeze they were getting close to britain and were seen from the camp when such a violent storm suddenly arose that none of them could keep their course, but some were carried back to the point from which they had started, while the others were swept down in great peril to the lower and more westerly part of the island. They anchored, notwithstanding, but as they were becoming waterlogged, were forced to stand out to sea in the face of night and make for the continent the same night it happened to be full moon which generally causes very high tides in the ocean a fact of which our men were not aware the result was that the galleys in which caesar had brought over troops and which he had drawn up on dry land were waterlogged while the transports which were at anchor were damaged by the storm and the men were unable to be of any service or go to their assistance several ships were wrecked the rest were rendered useless by the loss of their rigging, anchors, and other fittings. And naturally the whole army was seized by panic. There were no other ships to take them back. Everything required for repairing ships was lacking, and as the troops all understood that they would have to winter in Gaul, no corn for the winter had been provided on the spot. When this became known, the British chiefs who had waited on Caesar after the battle took counsel together. They knew that the Romans had neither cavalry nor ships nor grain, and they gathered that their troops were few from the smallness of the camp, which, as Caesar had taken over the legions without heavy baggage, was extraordinarily contracted. They therefore concluded that their best course would be to renew hostilities, cut off our men from corn and other supplies, and protract the campaign till winter, being confident that if they overpowered them or prevented their return, no invader would ever again come over to Britain. Accordingly, they renewed their oaths of mutual fidelity, and began to move away one by one from the camp, and to fetch their tribesmen secretly from the districts. Caesar was not yet aware of their plans, but from what had happened to his ships, and from the fact that the chiefs had left off sending hostages, he guessed what was coming. Accordingly, he prepared for all contingencies. He had corn brought in daily from the fields into camp, utilized the timber and bronze belonging to the ships that had been most severely damaged to repair the rest, and ordered everything required for the purpose to be brought over from the continent. The men worked with hearty good will, and thus, although twelve ships were lost, he managed to have the rest made tolerably seaworthy. Meanwhile, a legion, known as the Seventh, was sent out in the ordinary course to fetch corn. So far no one had suspected that hostilities were brewing, for some of the natives still remained in the districts, while others were actually passing in and out of the camp. But the troops on guard in front of the gates of the camp reported to Caesar that an unusual amount of dust was to be seen in the direction in which the legion had gone suspecting with good reason as it happened that the natives had hatched some scheme caesar ordered the cohorts on guard to accompany him in the direction indicated two of the others to relieve them and the rest to arm and follow him immediately he had advanced some little distance from the camp when he observed that his troops were hard pressed by the enemy and could barely hold their own the legion being huddled together and missiles hurled in from all sides all the corn had been cut except in this one spot, and the enemy, anticipating that the Romans would come here, had laid in wait in the woods during the night. Then, when the troops had laid aside their weapons and were dispersed and busy reaping, they had suddenly fallen upon them. A few were killed. The rest, whose ranks were not properly formed, were thrown into confusion, and the enemy's horse and war chariots had at the same time encompassed them chariots are used in action in the following way 
First of all, the charioteers drive all over the field, the warriors hurling missiles, and generally they throw the enemy's ranks into confusion by the mere terror inspired by their horses and the clatter of the wheels. As soon as they have penetrated between the troops of cavalry, the warriors jump off the chariots and fight on foot. The drivers, meanwhile, gradually withdraw from the action and range the cars in such a position that, if the warriors are hard pressed by the enemy's numbers, they may easily get back to them. Thus they exhibit in action the mobility of cavalry combined with the steadiness of infantry, and they become so efficient from constant practice and training that they will drive their horses at full gallop, keeping them well in hand down a steep incline check and turn them in an instant, run along the pole, stand on the yoke, and step backwards again to the cars with the greatest nimbleness. Our men were unnerved by these movements because the tactics were new to them, and Caesar came to their support in the nick of time. When he came up the enemy stood still, and our men recovered from their alarm. Thinking, however, that the moment was not favorable for challenging the enemy and forcing on a battle, he simply maintained his position, and, after a short interval, withdrew the legions into camp. During these operations our people were all busy, and the rest of the Britons who were still in their districts left them. Stormy weather followed for several days running, which kept the troops in camp, and prevented the enemy from attacking. Meantime the natives sent messengers in all directions, telling their tribesmen that our troops were few, and pointing out that they had an excellent opportunity for plundering and establishing their independence for good by driving the Romans from their camp. By these representations they speedily got together a large body of horse and foot, and advanced against the camp. Caesar foresaw that what had happened on previous days would happen again. Even if the enemy were beaten, their mobility would enable them to get off scot-free. However, he luckily obtained about thirty horsemen, whom the Atrebatian Comius, already mentioned, had taken over with him, and drew up the legions in front of the camp. A battle followed, and the enemy, unable to stand long against the onset of our troops, turned and fled. The troops pursued them as far as their speed and endurance would permit, and killed a good many of them, then, after burning all the buildings far and wide, they returned to camp. On the same day the enemy sent envoys who came to Caesar to sue for peace. He ordered them to find twice as many hostages as before, and take them across to the continent. For the equinox was near, and as his ships were unsound, he did not think it wise to risk a stormy passage. Taking advantage of favorable weather, he set sail a little after midnight. All the ships reached the continent in safety, but two transports were unable to make the same harbors as the rest, and drifted a little further down. Hi folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Finally, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of the History Project sponsors. Without your continued support, none of the good work we do would even be possible. So thank you.